Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Wiradjuri people as the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting this evening. And I'd like to recognize their unique contribution to our environmental and cultural heritage, past, present, and future. And I'd like to extend my deepest respect to all First Nations people in attendance here today, live or online. Um, um, so this evening's lecture um, will further strengthen our range of provocations. Um, entitled Behavioral Data Science as a Game Changer for Understanding the Interface Between Human and Digital Systems in the New Digital Economy. Uh, Professor Ghana Pagrebna, um, a genuine pioneer in behavioral data science, uh, will introduce the field, uh, discuss the impact um, of the field on cybersecurity, financial services, talent management, um, and leadership amongst other areas, uh, and demonstrate how this new field not only offers new models and methods of understanding, but also provides significant innovations in the context of the new digital economy and the, indust and the Industrial Revolution 4.0. Um, a few words by, by way of introducing Ghana. Um, and look, Ghana's intellectual journey has, has, has been absolutely incredible. Um, she, she studied economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and the University of Innsbruck in Austria. Um, she holds a PhD in economics and social sciences. And before coming to Charles Sturt, Ghana worked at Columbia University in New York, um, the University of Bonn, um, Humboldt University in, in Berlin, um, the University of Innsbruck in Austria, um, and she's held professorships at the University of Warwick, the University of Birmingham, and Sydney University. She also serves as lead of the behavioral data science strand at the Alan Turing um, Institute. Um, that's the National Centre for Artificial Intelligence and Data Science in, in London um, that has significant impact um, throughout the world. Um, so she blends behavioral science, artificial intelligence, computer science, data analytics, engineering, and business models. Um, and she helps cities, businesses, charities, and individuals to better understand why they make the decisions they make and how they can optimize the behavior to achieve higher profit, uh, to achieve better social outcomes, um, as well as flourish and bolster their well-being. Um, so Ghana's work on risk analytics and modeling was recognized by a Leverhulme Research Fellowship Award in January 2020. She was named as the winner of Tech Women 100, and that's a prize awarded to leading female experts in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in the UK. And she was also named as one of 20 inspiring data scientists by the AI Time Journal. I mean, we are so lucky when, when Ghana agreed to join us as the inaugural director of our Artificial Intelligence and Cyber Futures Institute here at Charles Sturt. Um, so I give you Ghana Pagrebna. Thank you, Mark. Um, thanks for being here. Yeah, I'm actually humbled that I have the audience today, considering that Matilda Saplain. Uh, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm Ghana Pagrebna and I'm uh, a behavioral data scientist. And just, I just wanted to ask how many people heard about behavioral data science? Okay, wow, that's quite a few. Um, yeah, so when I kind of came into the field, it wasn't called anything, so we had to come up with a name. Um, and uh, like Mark said, my original education was in economics. I'm a decision theorist. So in case you don't know who decision theorists are, we are kind of really frustrated people down in the microeconomics area. And why we are frustrated all the time is because we write models of human behavior, but then humans do not behave according to the models. So we have to write new models, then we test them again, they don't work again, then we kind of develop new models again. So, and, and that's how the field develops. Um, and basically yeah, at one point in my life, I. Um, got a job in engineering department and since that time I kind of do things that are more data scientist and they became more and more data scientist as I kind of 
went along. Yeah, just kind of to give you an idea of where you can find more information, we will have a book coming up uh, this year with Cambridge University Press on behavioral data science where you can read kind of a lot of interesting things about methodology. Um, and uh, yeah, we also have a website where we kind of post practical things. So the website is in operation. You can actually go to behavioraldatascience.org and find again a lot of interesting material to read if you're interested in the interested in the field. Yeah. So what is behavioral data science? So behavioral data science is an interdisciplinary field which combines uh, behavioral science methods with um, a lot of natural science methods. Uh, mostly from computing, um, but I'm, I'm going to introduce all kind of parts of uh, behavioral data science so you will see how it goes. So yeah, I already introduced myself, I explained my journey from sort of decision theorist into uh, behavioral data scientist and yeah, again, if you are interested in the work that I do, I'm on all social media. So if you cannot find me, it's your fault. Um, but um, yeah, so essentially, um, yeah, there is a lot of material. Um, yeah, this is kind of a short list of organizations that I worked with uh, in my career. And uh, there is kind of a longer list that's available probably on my website. But uh, the point is like why I'm able to work with all of these organizations is because a lot of my work is very methodological and mathematical. And then it applies to a lot of different domains. So the mathematics behind it kind of st stays the same, but it could be applied to different areas. Um, I was told that this is a provocation series. So I should say something provocative. So this is my provocative line. And um, I always like to give kind of people some elevator pitch. And this is what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, nations, organizations, and individuals do not have data problems. They have decision problems. And uh, these decision problems are usually, you know, supported by some sort of data, right? And uh, then we always uh, sort of judge uh, whether the data is good enough to solve a particular problem, right? So it's always, um, so when we look at data, we never look at, at data in isolation. We always look at data in the context, in the context of decision making. So if the data is helpful to you in, in solving a particular problem or making a particular decision, it's good data, <laughs> otherwise it's probably not very good data. And um, the field of behavioral data science uh, is uh, kind of helping you to get you kind of to the solution with minimum means, yeah? So sometimes you don't have enough data, but you can then potentially use some behavioral theory to substitute for the lack of data. Um, yeah, so kind of, um, yeah, um, I just wanted to go from a practical side because I know that uh, the audience here today is not just from uh, academia, but also from, uh, from uh, p uh, private and public sector. And um, essentially what we normally observe in many organizations is there are these two camps of people usually sitting on different floors. We have data science camp who work with hard data and they normally sit somewhere in the basement in organizations um, and don't talk to anyone. They just work with models and produce insights from, you know, something that they observe. And then we have behavioral scientists uh, who sit uh, somewhere at the top floor and they're more interested in the why, why customers do something, why people do something. And uh, they, they work with soft data, right? They normally go out and ask people to explain their decisions. Um, and these two camps kind of, they all produce value and insights but they never talk to each other. And a lot of times what we do, what my team does when we arrive to any organization, we kind of get all these two camps into one room and then we'll try to figure out how they could work together. Yeah, and normally this collaboration produces better insights uh, and uh, allows us to solve interesting problems. 
Um, yeah, so why I asked you whether you heard about behavioral data science so before I started talking about it is that there's a lot of kind of interesting information online and it's not always correct. Um, because a lot of people think that data science is some sort of behavioral analytics, it's not. Uh, some people think that it's some sort of fancy marketing or digital marketing, it's not. Um, so the, the field itself, and we've been looking at it uh, while we were doing the handbook um, over several years, um, uh, is essentially split into three main parts. There is human behavior, algorithmic behavior, and systems behavior. So in human behavior, you normally find people like myself who come from either economics uh, background or psychology background, and we're trying to understand uh, how, um, how, how humans operate you know, in, in, uh, in the world and how they perceive technology, how they interact with technology. The second strand on algorithmic behavior is, is a strand where people look into algorithms. Normally they come uh, from kind of statistical background or more mathematical background. And here you have like really cool people like uh, my colleague Marisa Chop from um, Switzerland who uh, basically develops IQ tests for various algorithms. And her job is to figure out is Siri smarter than Cortana or you know something like this. Yeah, just to tell you the answer, Siri is smarter than Cortana. Um, and um, finally, we have systems behavior people. So these are normally people who come from engineering background and they look at complex systems. Uh, so basically how humans interact with uh, technology in a complex system, let's just say a city or a transport system. So things like this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so there are two components to behavioral data science. We have behavioral science and we have data science. And behavioral science is a um, conceptual field, right? That gives us some theories and models of the world um, that helps us kind of that help us understand what it is, right? Help, help us make sense of the world. Data science is a methodological field. That's a service field. Uh, so what it can do, it can help us build something based on theory, but theory needs to come from somewhere else. And here it comes from behavioral science. So um, it's a little bit like the distinction between mathematics and engineering, right? So mathematics gives us some models uh, of the world and then engineering can help us build a bridge based on some mathematical principles. So it's a similar mix, right? Um, and here we, um, we have normally kind of four strands of methods uh, from um, taking a, so the first, the first strand in, in green there, what it does essentially it takes behavioral theory and it tests it on huge data, right? So it's essentially like running a standard behavioral science study but you would have instead of kind of randomized control trial or an experiment, you will have a large data set. Then you can use traditional uh, data science techniques to solve behavioral problems. That's also very interesting. And I will give some examples. Um, another strand uh, is kind of uh, helping us to overcome deficiencies in data science methods by using some behavioral theory. And finally, so this is where my work uh, <laughs> is mostly concentrated, is hybrid models. So this is when we actually mix um, behavioral uh, science methods into machine learning methods, and we come up with new machine learning methods, which are normally quite cool and allow us to do a lot of cool, cool things. Yeah, so why do we need all of this, you know, this, uh, all this field? Well, um, I'm just going to talk about one example because I really like concrete things rather than general. So as you know, we already lived through four industrial revolutions. We're now living through the fourth one. And uh, these are kind of like all the industrial revolutions that happened, but, um, and kind of a skeptic view at each of them. Like my personal favorite is uh, 
and, and the the one about the automation revolution uh, where it was kind of suggested that there is no reason for any individual to have a computer in his home. Well, now not only we have computers in our homes, we have computers in our pockets. <laughs> so, <laughs> so obviously, uh, so the point of showing you this is that, you know, it's uh, the industrial revolution for zero with AI, it already happened, right? So AI is no longer an emerging technology. It's a, it's a standard technology and it affects everybody and it affects jobs, you know, and, but it affects jobs in the same, in the same way, in the sense that it affected jobs, that, that other industrial revolutions affected jobs and we adapted and we lived through it. So I'm, a, I'm an optimist in that sense. Uh, there are many jobs that are replaceable, as you know. And there are many jobs that are high risk and uh, it's no longer enough to be kind of in a creative profession to be protected against automation. In fact, you know, we, we have, um, you know, uh, music composed by AI. Uh, you can write a script uh, with AI, you know, and, and do a lot of other things. Yeah, um, and there are different sort of ways in which we understand this and uh, um, you know, there are different uh, sort of uh, uh, projection of uh, projections uh, and, and look, uh, looks at uh, uh, industry of the future. Some projections are quite optimistic, so some are pessimistic. So the, the most famous pessimistic view comes from the University of Oxford. The most famous optimistic view comes from OECD. But basically the point is that between 10% and like 45% of jobs will be affected as a result of the current industrial revolution. <clears throat> and the way we normally analyze the jobs is using behavioral theory in combination with labor economics. Essentially what we do is we split all the skills that you need for a job into kind of basic creative and social. And the more social component you have in the job, the least rep less replaceable you are. So we can come up with graphs like this and actually tell in any organization, you know, approximately what the risk uh, is of particular uh, profession to be replaced. So I, I always kind of say to organizations that if you can exactly explain what you are doing, exactly describe what you are doing, um, then you're very much replaceable because then machine can do it as well. If you are struggling, you know, like as a, as an institute director, I'm really struggling to explain what I'm doing on a daily basis. So then <laughs> it's hard, it's hard to replace. Um, yeah. So, and, and the point of show, yeah, the point of showing you this is also like we, on a regular basis, we go out and ask people about their attitude towards uh, uh, industrial revolution. And we, what we observe is actually quite, um, quite an interesting thing. So when we ask, will industrial revolution affect uh, the industry, everybody, almost everybody says yes. But when we ask people, will industrial revolution affect your job in particular, almost everybody says no. So clearly industrial revolution will affect people, but not us, you know, not, not me individually. Um, and that's true for uh, any country, including Australia. Yeah, so, so yeah, like my point here is that, you know, we, we have this illusion of control that we are controlling technology, but actually we're not controlling anything. Imagine that uh, everything that dependent on technology today wouldn't work. We wouldn't be here today, we wouldn't be sitting in this room. We wouldn't be, you wouldn't be uh, uh, listening to this lecture. So, so currently we don't need, you know, creative skills anymore to be protected against sort of automation but we need transferable skills. So we actually need to learn how to be adaptive to technology. And uh, yeah, in a sense, if previously we looked at sort of just uh, uh, um, sort of uh, machine algorithms and kind of, kind of human component and organizations, currently we need sort of kind of like a neo Right, so it's not no longer just architect, no longer just oracle, but you need uh, uh, a hybrid. Uh, and uh, as a leader, you know, in any organization, 
uh, you would currently not just lead a team of people, you are le you're leading a mix of algorithms and people, which is really exciting. Um, so just a, just a brief note on chat GPT. Just going to check my time. Yeah. Um, so I know that a lot of people are excited about it, but um, why the behavior, behavioral science is great in understanding this, uh, th this phenomenon of ChatGPT and it, why it is so popular is actually ChatGPT is a quite stupid algorithm. It doesn't learn anything. What it shows you, it, it already learned, right? So it was trained on uh, 175 billion uh, variables and on a lot of text. Right, the lots of text observations, um, but it actually doesn't learn anything when you are typing and retyping and you are trying to kind of create different queries. So there is no feedback loop in this program. So in a sense, it's not actually a smart algorithm. What it is, uh, you know, even though it's more popular than all other uh, uh, algorithms out there, it's like a game of like trivial pursuit or monopoly. So you can have different scenarios b based on the, you know, the, the game setup, but, um, you know, the, the game itself doesn't change. So, and, and uh, in that sense, you know, it's very e important to have uh, other methods where we can um, make algorithms understand people better and make algorithms um, serve the values of, of, of humans better. So this is what the, you know, behavioral data science is all about because, you know, we have a lot of deficiencies of algorithms. We can still fool the algorithms with, you know, like if we have a ban banana on one side and we add a sticker, you know, we no longer, uh, uh, the algorithm no longer recognizes it as a banana, will recognize it as something else. The algorithms will recognize like random noise as something um, equally here. Or, you know, it cannot tell the difference between a dog and a muffin, a dog and a, uh, you know, bread, or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> croissant, and things like this. Um, so, yeah, there is a lot of stupidity in, mach in machines because machines do not think like humans. Um, they try to mimic us, like ChatGPT tries to mimic communication, but mimicking is not actual communication. It's not actual understanding of human values. So in behavioral data science, we have in, so in, sorry, in straight behavioral science, we kind of have two approaches. One approach works with models, mathematical models. Um, and another one works with heuristics and biases. So what is the difference? So here we kind of mostly assume that people uh, have some sort of rationality or some sort of rules uh, based on which they're making decisions. And uh, the, other, the other kind of camp uh, of behavioral science believes that, oh, it's all about heuristics and hom common sense. Um, so, yeah, if you are kind of in, a, in first uh, uh, strand, you will be working with models like this. If you are in second strand, you will be working with a bunch of heuristics and biases. And with my course, Arkar and Renault, we put them nicely in the table for you. But there are 202 biases and heuristics here in this table, uh, and there are probably more, right? Um, and the point is, yeah, like there is there are all these different views, but they help us understand humans, right? And they help us form uh, theories about humans. So I promised uh, you uh, that I will give uh, some examples based on this methodology, methodological groups that I identified at the beginning. So the first one is when we take standard behavioral science and then we just, uh, you know, uh, conduct a study using large database. So I talked a lot about jobs today and uh, in this particular project we looked at uh, all data touching um, professions uh, within organizations and basically we were trying to understand why there is uh, lack of um, efficiency between different departments involving data science and data analytics. And basically what you see here is, uh, so what we've done is we mined uh, all job descriptions that are out there 
um, that uh, contained data science or data analytics in it or, you know, related fields like cybersecurity. And what we found was, you know, considering our basic division according to behavioral science and the basic creative and social uh, skills that you need for different jobs, uh, what we found was that there was a lot of overlap on basic skills and, on, and some on creative, but this, uh, all these uh, professions were really shallow on social component. So what does it tell us? It basically tells us that, first of all, uh, when we have data scientists, for example, in different departments, we think that there is duplication of uh, skill, but actually there is... Uh, it, it's, there is no du duplication of skill. We just do not communicate well enough. And second thing that we, we understand from this study is that we need to teach <laughs> data science in different way. We actually need to create this uh, social buffer. We need to create uh, social skills when we're teaching um, data science so that we have better communication between departments in the same organization. Um, so, the next trend is using traditional data science to solve interesting behavioral problems. So, this is a, a project that we've done with a very large Australian bank. Um, and uh, this project was about human habits. So, we were actually looking at uh, habits before and after a particular crisis, and we had bushfire and COVID uh, case, use cases. Um, and essentially, we were trying to predict uh, um, uh, people that will fall into financial hardship as a result of a crisis. Um, and the way we've done it is by understanding habits. Uh, what financial habits you had before the crisis, right? Um, and we used a very standard model for it that is used uh, in many data science um, studies. It's associations rules mining. So if you, if you don't know what it is, this is basically uh, what they use in supermarkets to understand how to position goods in supermarkets. So one of the funniest things that this algorithm produced is uh, the fact that there is a correlation between buying uh, diapers and beer. So people who buy diapers are like 95% likely to buy beer at the same time, which is why in supermarkets you often find these things close together. Um, but we thought, why just apply it to supermarket stuff? Why just apply it to diapers and beer? Like, we can actually apply it to financial transactions. And this is what we've done in this, in this study. So we had a really good sample, many thousands of people, many millions of observations over several years. And basically, uh, what we did, we looked at uh, uh, people's kind of rules associations before the crisis and after the crisis. And uh, what it allowed us to do, it allowed us to identify uh, what resilient, uh, vulnerable, and well-calibrated uh, uh, habits looked like, right? So, so essentially, people with, uh, um, resili who are resilient to, to financial, for example, to COVID, uh, so who financially came out better off as a result of COVID, they had fewer rules. Um, and they also had, uh, well, they were, these rules were not very flexible, but there were, there were a few of them, so it was easy to adjust. So, for example, if I have a, uh, a rule that I'm going out every Friday, right, I would just uh, order Uber Eats or something like this. So, it's a robust rule, but it, it would be, like, adaptable. Then we would have um, uh, well-calibrated people who had... Uh, relatively many rules, but they were very flexible. So, you know, you had a really good capacity to change and you would be able to adapt quickly. But people who uh, were vulnerable, so in a sense that they came out actually worse off as a result of the crisis, these were people who had many rules and very low flexibility. So, um, the cool thing about this project is we are able to identify these behavioral types one year ahead of the crisis. So we can actually look at these profiles, identify them, and then, you know, if something happens, we can actually work with the right population and uh, prevent, um, you know, them falling into debt or, you know, um, experiencing uh, negative financial outcomes. 
Um, so I'm almost done, but yeah, I want, I want to show you a few other examples. So this is a strand where we detect deficiencies in data science methods. And there are deficiencies in data science methods. Well, remember the dog and the muffin? That's one of them. But I want to show you this one as kind of one of my favorite examples when we take uh, the photo of Barack Obama, right? And we try to reconstruct it and we get a white guy. Um, and uh, why we get a white guy is, is because we have a data set that is incomplete or biased. So, you know, we just have too many photos of, of white people uh, in, the, in, in the data, in the training set. And this is how it reconstructs uh, uh, um, a photograph when we, want, when we are trying to do it. So, and these deficiencies and uh, problems with algorithms, they come up on a regular basis because previously when we, uh, when we would uh, write algorithms, we could simply uh, solve very simple bugs in them. But now it's not enough. Uh, it's, it's almost like you need a psychiatrist for an algorithm, right? So it's very difficult to figure out what's, what's wrong with it. Um, so for this, this particular project, what we do is we actually look at how people do, did job crafting during COVID. Um, job crafting is basically refers to a situation when you are changing your job uh, in, uh, um, during the crisis. Um, so, um, so you can take up more tasks, you can decide that you need to upskill, you can decide that you need additional responsibilities or fewer responsibilities. And uh, <clears throat> these are the restrictions that we had in different countries. So here we have UK, US and China data. And basically, yeah, we're looking at how people adjust to their jobs dependent on the number of restrictions that are out there. And I'm just going to skip ahead to the results. Um, so basically, um, yeah. So basically, we, what we found in this, uh, in this uh, uh, project is the best strategy for a crisis is for you to kind of increase the number of tasks that you're doing, increase the complexity of your job, and then adjust it down and adjust, uh, adjust your kind of job, job description down once the crisis is, is kind of uh, e easing uh, e and one, once, it's kind of once it's over. Uh, in, that, in that case, you will not experience unemployment and you will not experience burnout. But um, actually, one of the worst scenarios, in fact, the worst scenario is kind of trying to... So, so essentially, like what you should be doing is, you know, you should be thinking, oh, maybe I should do s something additional in my job. Maybe I should take up, you know, organizing a seminar or uh, organizing a, like yoga group, uh, like online yoga group in COVID situations, thing things like this. But actually, the people who were uh, really worse off were the people who were trying to downsize. So those who try to downsize on the tasks and how to, how to try to kind of think how to, um, uh, you know, run the most risk averse strategy in, uh, in the crisis in terms of their jobs, they were worse off. Not only did they, uh, many of them lost their jobs, but also they experienced burnout because they were constantly thinking, how do I minimize, you know, how do I uh, minimize my tasks? Yeah, so <clears throat> this is quite complicated. I'm not going to go too much into detail here, but this is what I do on a regular basis. These are hybrid models. And this is where we basically um, take a standard machine learning models and we pre-treat them with some decision series. So um, it allows us to create very uh, efficient algorithms that, uh, that allow us to make very uh, um, precise predictions of what people are going to do. So imagine that you have a choice between a red car and a blue car, and these cars have a lot of attributes, right? Lots of lots of characteristics. So normally what machine learning model would do, it will kind of sample different baskets of attributes and dependent on whether you've, you ultimately have chosen blue or red car, it would kind of take each basket and look at 
does, uh, so this basket is latent, we don't know what's inside it, but basically the algorithm would look at does this basket uh, explain your choice, does this basket explain your choice. So it's a very tedious process and in the end it's a black box algorithm, we don't know why yeah, you know, the algorithm picks uh, uh, this particular basket and what, uh, what's inside it. But um, from decision theory, we know how people may, are making choices. So we uh, actually can, given this, this example, let's just say that uh, these cars are very similar, but like I said, one car is blue, the other one is red. So from decision theory, we can say that color will be an important factor in your decision making, right? Um, so usually, obviously, it's more sophisticated. I'm just using this as a simple example. So um, what does it mean? It means that we don't actually need to sample everything. We can just sample the baskets that have color in it, right? So by doing this, I kind of slice my calculations in half and I make them more accurate because, you know, I know that the color will be important, right? So this is how we do, we have done a lot of uh, work on uh, uh, suggestion systems. So this is a project where we try to predict people's uh, uh, choices of uh, fi f films, of the films that they watch. And uh, not, only we, uh, not only did we achieve higher satisfaction levels, but also we achieved higher engagement on this particular platform for people who used the uh, algorithm based on the method that I just showed you, which is called anthropomorphic learning. Um, yeah, and uh, just uh, to, to kind of wrap, wrap it up, uh, I want to show you one more study that, I, that I've been doing for the last five years. And it's really cool from my perspective because it's about how people perceive technology. So it's one thing to develop all these fantastic algorithms, but it's quite another to look at how people actually, how well uh, people actually understanding technology. So this is my dog who passed away, but he was an experimentalist dog. And uh, this thing that he wears is called feed bark. It's like feed bit only for dogs. So it collects all the data. And this is the data on my dog. So it's all the, it's basically his, his, his day. Um, so basically what does it mean? It means that I can take this, da this data and I can upload it to a thing like this, a robotic dog, and it will behave exactly like my, my dog, right? But it doesn't mean that I will interact with the robot like I did with my actual dog, right? Um, so, and, and um, you know, this is an important concept and, uh, um, you know, to what extent we, we kind of understand the technology, to what extent we can tell the difference is important. So in this particular project, we looked uh, for over the period of five years at how well uh, people uh, understand or perceive or can identify and detect deep fakes. So you all know about deep fakes. Uh, so these are essentially, you know, <laughs> either, either video, text or audio. Uh, a type of uh, media that uh, kind of poses as someone, right? Normally a celebrity or like here we have an example of Ukrainian president that was kind of faked by Russian propaganda where he was saying that, well, we need to surrender, but obviously Ukrainian people didn't buy it. Um, so yeah, we have quite a long history of these things like back to, for example, to the Soviet era when, you know, the photographs were doctored uh, and we had different realities. So this is another uh, example that I'm, I'm sure all of you have seen, the fake uh, resignation by President Nixon uh, that was uh, done by uh, MIT Media Lab. So we have all these deep fakes and um, um, we have different types of algorithms that generate them and uh, we, over a course of uh, five years, we were trying to understand uh, are we becoming better or are we becoming worse in recognizing deep fakes. Um, and we measure a lot of psychological parameters uh, with our uh, participants. And yeah, we have quite a lot of countries here. So we started with US and UK, but now we have Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, and we have different contexts. We have celebrities that we show to people, but we also show them regular people, which makes it quite difficult to pick up that it's a deep fake. 
Um, and the result of this, uh, this study was quite striking. We found that actually, well, first of all, we are becoming worse at identifying deep fakes um, because deep fakes become more sophisticated. But there is a silver lining here. Well, I'm actually a believer that we will adapt. Uh, we will become better when we develop more experience in talking to machines and uh, looking at them. And we find, found out that actually three main charac human characteristics that make you exceptionally good at identifying deep fakes. Because in our tests, there are people who always get it right, like 100% all the time. So, and what we decided to do is we decided to understand what is it about these people that is different from the rest. And that's what we found, basically. They have three characteristics, conscientiousness, emotional intelligence, and prevention focus. Conscientiousness is attention to detail. So when you're essentially um, you know, very meticulous, very attentive to detail. Emotional intelligence is when you are obviously good at recognizing people's emotions. And uh, prevention focus uh, is essentially um, uh, well, it's, it's uh, basically uh, fo fo uh, focusing on pre um, uh, preventing losses, right? So you uh, are, are becoming, again, particularly attentive, you're very careful. So people who are, uh, who, 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 whom we call deep fake sensors, so they're actually very, very good at identifying deep fakes, these people are a lot more conscientious, a lot more emotionally intelligent, and a lot more preventive than the average. Um, and um, <clears throat> this basically tells us that you know people with these characteristics can identify deep, deep fakes really, really well. So now uh, our task is to, to figure out how to teach everybody else to do it, right? So how do we teach conscientiousness, emotional intelligence, and prevention? Um, I'm going to stop here and I just want to thank you for being here and for being with us online. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Gunnar. That's some fascinating, fascinating stuff. Um, I mean, I've just realized that in a sense I've, I've been studying um, the fourth industrial revolution all my life through popular culture. And if you think about it, you know, Star Wars and the Clone, the clone Wars, you know, AI armies, or um, Terminator and Skynet, and all the ethics around Skynet. You know, my favorite Blade Runner. Yeah, um, there is actually a very good uh, British uh, series. It's called Outer Limits. I really recommend you to watch that. It was made in the 90s, and it's got like, I don't know, 200 episodes. And it's basically every single futuristic scenario that you can imagine, and everything that can go wrong, like in terms of, you know, ethics and other things. Isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so of course, that's, th that's the key point, because all of those films have big ethical issues. Um, that emerge from this. And, and I think what's quite interesting, um, and, I, and I guess this isn't just in Australia, but, but more broadly, that, that actually we, we've been discussing those issues um, through popular culture, but we've not really been discussing those issues as much um, through public policy or, or, or public debate. Um, and Well, that's an interesting observation um, in itself, um, but what, what do you think are, are the fundamental ethical issues to do with AI that we need to get to grip, grips with really quite urgently? Yeah, I think, uh, well, there are a few, right? So the first one is obviously the, the black box issue. Uh, I mean, we are trying to solve it in different ways, but we still, um, in many cases, do not know how, you know, how the algorithm is making choices and why. This is happening. Um, so the second thing, uh, I mean, I'm just going to go with data, um, you know, data usage, not so much with data privacy, because, um, well, uh, let's just say, uh, I, I come to you and say, Mark, I want to look at your, I don't know, shopping habits uh, for research purposes. Is it okay if I do that? And you probably say, yeah, fine, why not? But then, 
uh, imagine that I take your shopping habits and I combine it with some other data. Mm. Then suddenly I know something about you that you don't want me to know, right? And then there is this whole uh, big problem. And uh, yeah, there, there was a very cool example that I really like about it. Um, a few years back, uh, New York uh, mm, Yellow Cabs uh, uh, company released uh, its its data for public use. So, so what uh, you could see in that data set is well, a, a passenger was picked up at point A and dropped off at point at point B. Uh, I just want to invite audience to guess who were the the top users of this database. It was a live database, so you could actually, you know, observe it live. Who, uh, who do you think used it most? Any, any guesses? Or give me some guess. Yeah, students. Yeah. What? Well, not quite criminals. They were paparazzis. So the reason why the paparazzi were really interested in it, imagine that you are following, I don't know, Scarlett Johansson, right? And um, you, know, you know that Scarlett Johansson got into a cab on a at a certain point, right? Then you don't even need to go to point B because you can see it in the database. And imagine that that point B is a private residence, right? So all of a sudden, you know where, where Scarlett Johansson lives, even without following her in the car, right? So, so this is kind of the, the type of, you know, challenge that we have. Um, and uh, obviously, um, Kind of more, I guess, more fundamental problems uh, that we have with uh, the whole debate around, uh, you know, um, what, you know, what, what uh, relationships should we have with technology, right? To what extent uh, technology should intervene into people's lives? To what extent we should, uh, you know, regulate it? That would be, I guess, uh, another big one. Well, I guess is the Darth Vader. <coughs> point, a hybrid <laughs> point as well as, you know, that uh, as this technology um, advances, you know, you will see um, people becoming half machine, half um, human. Yeah, I mean, you actually hit the, the good point because every time when we ask people uh, about AI in the lab, they imagine Terminators and Skynet. Um, and we're trying to explain to them that, you know, we're quite far away from developing Terminators. So Terminators are basically machines that de uh, determine their own purpose and determine the means to get to the purpose. Well, at the moment we have uh, uh, what we call autotelenomic machines. So these are machines that, um, that are given the purpose, but then they can determine their own pathway to the purpose. So for example, you can have a, um, a you know, automated vacuum cleaner and you can just tell it or oh, clean the room, right? But then it determines how to clean the room in its own way. But, um, you know, it, it, uh, it, will, it cannot determine the task to clean the room. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, but this is very common when, mm -hmm. when people imagine that, you know, this is a, there is a terminator. But, but there are kind of deeper issues here. For example, let's take a uh, driverless car that hit a pedestrian in Arizona, mm -hmm. right, in 2016. And um, there is an ethical issue there because, uh, you know, this is a loss of human life over the fact that algorithm wasn't ready, you mm. know, re ready to be used on the road, right? And there is not only a question of responsibility, was Uber responsible because they put it on the road or city council who allowed, mm. allowed it or the, you know, h human operator who was sitting at the wheel and wasn't paying attention because ultimately th between um, the time between the car uh, uh, hit the pedestrian, saw the, the pedestrian and hit the pedestrian was six seconds. So that's actually enough time for a human driver to react and stop on time. And you know, like, yeah, to what extent the technology is ready for us to mm. engage with it? That's a big question. And how ready we are. And how ready we as are. Well. Absolutely. And I was thinking, so I, the first article I wrote, um, in 1994 was on regulation theory. Um, and regulation theory at that time focused on the impact of technology on, on the workforce. 
and we were and we were basically told at that time that the big public policy question was uh, well if uh, the majority of the workforce are going to be out of work through traditional um, through the traditional labor market how do we destigmatize unemployment how do we create new types of job for the future that was in 1994 and we're, obviously your first slides were all about you know these are potentially the areas where we're going to see the change but we're actually still waiting for the change yeah and and actually the preparation for change hasn't been that 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 significant either i mean we know that behind the scenes governments are making choices so for example there was a project that i was involved in called the nadia project uh, which for me was really interesting because so nadia um, basically was invented by mark sager who's a professor at auckland university he won an oscar for spider-man right and nadia basically was an artificial an, art, an ai public servant actually it was kate blanchett providing advice through the National Disability Insurance Scheme, right? Um, and I was involved in, in the project that, that developed Nadia, right? And basically, it went as far as um, they were very serious trials took place um, with really amazing results, right? So on average, um, people on the scheme were spending an hour and 15 minutes with Nadia. And Nadia wasn't just giving information out. She was actually building relationships. She was actually providing a sense of therapy and security for a lot of people who don't have people to talk to about the, these issues. So all the pilots, really, really successful. Then what happens? This is Turnbull. There's an election around the corner. They um, sent an estimate, I don't actually records that there will be 40,000 jobs job losses and there will be savings from those 40,000 jobs around call centers, right? Then what happens is they model where those call centers are. They're all in marginal constituencies, right? So suddenly minister says, we can't do this, right? And now Nadia is sitting in the atrium of the Department of Social Services in Canberra. And it's been there since, since just before that election. So I guess what I'm saying is, Governments make choices about the pace of change, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so, so f for you, where do you, where do you see, because it seems that this era is very, very fast in terms of rapid change, mm -hmm. but where do you see kind of the new big discoveries that are going to transform our everyday lives? Maybe in five years' time, what will be the big changes that we will experience um, as citizens. Yeah, so I, uh, I'm, I'm going to be biased and I will say that, you know, obviously it's in the hybrid uh, models uh, area. Uh, so for me, uh, the, the biggest task and I think the interesting challenge and wh where I, I'd like uh, the behavioral data science to be is uh, when the algorithms are created with uh, human values in mind, right? So when it's actually uh, executing some of the some of the value systems that we have, like um, a, an example that I can give is uh, First Nations, right? First Nations are completely invisible to AI systems because current AI systems are created as human centric or business centric, but they're not country centric. Right? And um, uh, indigenous uh, or First Nations philosophy is all about the country. So we're not even having these algorithms in existence. And this is where I think behavioral data science is important because with understanding the values, you know, and understanding how we can take behav uh, behavioral methods that uh, nurture these values, we can actually develop better algorithms that serve the community better. So that's where I'd like it to be. And I think that that's it, where it should be in the there, five years time. Are there um, pro prospects for improving democracy there, for example? So, you, so I know that there's been some experiments in, in certain US states about developing avatars for citizens, um, citizens, uh, aren't answer a whole range of questions around preferences on, 
on public policy choices, and then they have their av avatar, and their avatar sits in a, in a virtual assembly and makes decisions, basically, through direct democracy arrangements. Can, can you envisage that? Well, I, th I think that we saw examples when uh, AI hurt democracy, you know, I, 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 so basically we have uh, technology is a tool, right? And uh, mm -hmm. you can use it for, for good and for evil. Uh, we saw, for example, uh, Cambridge Analytica that mm -hmm. manipulated uh, public, uh, public opinion. Well, it, there is it's still debated to what extent, but, you know, it, it, it happened. Um, yeah, certainly, um, I think that where it could really provide uh, good um, opportunities is with, uh, let's just say, uh, for example, disability or inclusion, you know, where we, uh, we have people who are currently not engaged in the public uh, discourse, you know, or in, in, uh, in, in democratic processes. So if technology gives them more opportunities mm, more to do that, yeah, so, you know, yeah, of course, if you're living in a remote area and it takes you ages to get to a voting station and instead you can vote in a different way, uh, that, uh, that is definitely something that technology do. And I, I personally would really like to see it happen. Yeah. But, but trust is clearly key, isn't it? Building that trust. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, can, can, I haven't got any questions coming through Slido yet. So for those people online, I encourage you to ask questions through Slido. But have we any questions from, from, from the floor? Anybody, does anybody have a burning question that they'd like to, to put to Ghana? Sharon. I'm really interested in um, I think yeah. it just oh, the... I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's so fascinating the, just the breadth of things that you have thought about. I'm just really interested in what you have done with the data from your dog. <laughs> um, yeah, I have uh, all sorts of da uh, data. I also have, uh, for example, uh, a few years back, my mom wanted to lose weight. I have very detailed uh, data on her, like, and... Uh, uh, yeah, she kind of, uh, she managed to lose weight with my help, <laughs> you know, so yeah, I actually very often collect data on uh, people who are around me, but luckily, you know, they are tolerable and, you know, equally, equally with, uh, it was the same with the dog. Yeah, so how I use it is, uh, you know, we have a few robotic dogs and, yeah, we kind of test uh, uh, various uh, programs, uh, you know, based on the data that I have. And yeah, uh, that is just, uh, you know, I guess habit, you know, always to collect <laughs> data. Question here. Yeah. Hi, just a quick question in regards to the different revolutions we've gone through. I believe the time between each revolution shortens mm. in between revolutions. So as you've described, we are in the fourth revolution, AI revolution. What's going to be the next revolution? When's it happen? And can AI predict it or can we predict it? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, a good, uh, it's a good question. Um, uh, so what happens beyond uh, yeah, industrial revolution for zero? I think it's already happening. I think uh, it will be sort of more, sp uh, it, it's more kind of a revolution of minds in, in, my, in, in, in my view, because people become really reliant on algorithms in their choice, which, which is like a real danger. Or for example, you know, while we think that we, we make choices on social media, for example, but in fact, they are not human choices, they're algorithmic choices. So what you, you know, what you see as your kind of uh, highlights that you're choosing from is chosen by the algorithm. Equally, people are using ChatGPT a lot, and it has been shown already that it kind of inbreeds, right? Like if you, um, if you're using it, it kind of becomes more stupid over time. Um, yeah, so it, it's interesting how we are going to adapt to this and will, you know, we uh, um, sort of, uh, as a result, will, will, will there be some sort of like human algorithmic mind or will it be human mind, right? Uh, with understanding of the limitations of the algorithmic mind, yeah. So I think it will be more about our consciousness, consciousness and less about 
you know, automating something at work. I guess the interdisciplinarity in terms of the work that you've identified provides some clues. So, for example, nanotechnology and miniaturization makes a whole range of things possible that weren't possible before. So, for example, how the smartphone might be replaced um, through some sort of chip, yeah. um, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Well, I mean, there are also a lot of kind of cybersecurity, uh, you know, new mm -hmm. cybersecurity challenges where it will be more about, you know, disrupting somebody's uh, kind of device, so, you know, that, I don't know, some, some sort of thing that uh, helps your health, right, rather than uh, trying to disrupt your computer. So, yeah, there are a lot of interesting things, but yeah, the... The, uh, having uh, around people working in different disciplines helps and I have my team here and they all di work in different fields, you know, completely different fields. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have in our institute people who work in uh, fundamental, you know, physics um, uh, and uh, can make things like uh, liquid chips, microchips, mm -hmm. things like that to digital health and uh, blockchain and all other things. So, uh, so I think that it always helps to talk to people from different fields because that's how you, you move forward. And, uh, but um, what I want to say is that, you know, the, the progress, whatever it is, would require uh, closer synergies between completely different fields. Mm -hmm. So it's no longer just, you know, economists talking to psychologists, but it will be like physicists talking to, mm -hmm. uh, talking to behavioral scientists or, you know, health talking to, I don't know, uh, robotics, you know, things like this. Yeah. So, so the implications for a university like this really are very, very significant, aren't they? Um, in terms of breaking down silos between disciplines um, and it's an opportunity for, for real interdisciplinarity to, to take place. Given that we're here in a university then, um, how do you think that the, the student experience could change as a consequence of, of, of AI? Yeah, so um, if you think about it, we are educating people who will be retiring in, what, 50, 60 years' time? Mm. Um, and I think that's scary because we have no idea what challenges are going to be, right? Um, and that's why I, I personally think that uh, teaching that transferable component is very important. And uh, to me, uh, like I was kind of, kind of doing some thinking around it. And uh, recently I met um, kind of teach, teachers organization who are organizing sort of um, uh, uh, challenges for student, high school mm -hmm. students. Um, and uh, I think they found the perfect formula and it's participating in research projects. It's actually involving mm -hmm. people in research from very, very early age. Because whatever you are thinking about your research project never works right? like, you, like, you, like you thought it would. So you always have to adapt. So I think these transferable skills really develop when we involve, you know, school kids in research from a very early age and then, you know, students. So I think um, to be really adaptable to, 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 to teach that transferability, we really need to have more research component to each subject in the, in the university. So I guess mm -hmm. it means more work for you, Mark, mm -hmm. <laughs> in the future. But I'm also thinking about, you know, will we see a time basically when every student has, has an AI buddy, for mm. example, that helps support them through, through, their, through their degree, through their educational experience? Or mm. might that be a source of inequality? Well, I think it's, it's, it already happened, right? Because so ChatGPT, mm. in a sense, is everybody's buddy. I don't know whether it's a good buddy or is mm. a friend or mm. a foe. That's another question. Um, it just depends on how you use it, right? I just think that people who, like maybe with research experience, even, you know, basic research experience, they probably can find better ways uh, mm. to use that body. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, in terms of, you know, traveling with a robot, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that many people are open to it. Uh, like, for example, we uh, often ask people, you know, do you, like, would you be um, uh, open to be taught by a robot? And a lot of people say yes to that question. But uh, interestingly, when we ask them, would you like, 
you keep the bit on by robot, they say no. So like there is a lot of tolerance, you know, towards kind of uh, when it, you're, they're talking about themselves and completely different when they're talking about someone else. Yeah, in terms of, you know, will it happen? I think it already happened. Like we, yeah. we have uh, support, like algorithmic support in different, uh, uh, different levels. Um, it probably will get more, sh sh will get shiny and more sophisticated, mm, mm. cuter, and you know maybe you know a little bit more entertaining. But uh, in in the essence, we already are there. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there is a danger there, though, that uh, rich people will have access to to higher quality advice and technology, which will give them competitive advantage. So that's something that we'll need to. Yeah, yeah, but that, that again is already there and we yeah. again at uh, AI and Cyber Futures Institute constantly highlight the difference mm. between rural and urban areas yes. where yeah. effectively people from rural areas are the ones who are providing the data for mm. training. Like, uh, you know, if we take um, uh, rural areas, most people there are on Android phones rather than on iPhones. And uh, we, uh, you know, the, the, uh, there is uh, exponentially more data collected from uh, from Android phones, and a lot of you know data sets are based on them. But then uh, we take that data, and that data benefits, and models that are built on that data benefits people in urban uh, contexts and urban environments. So there's definitely inequality. But you know, again. I just want to say that technology can be uh, something that divides, but it can also be used as a social lift, right? And it just depends yeah. how we do it. And mm -hmm. yeah, this is where public policy comes in. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, th there is a lot to be done in this area, I think. Well, look, we've come to the end of our, our time together. Uh, thank you so much, Ghana, for such a thought-provoking um, address.